I'm Phil May. And I'm Dick Taylor. And you're watching Noise 11. Yeah. No flipping. And welcome into Noise11.com. Phil May, Dick Taylor, The Pretty Things. Hi there. You've finally got down here after all these years. Yeah, yeah, 47 yeah. years, three months. 47 years, yeah. Three months. Yeah. What, when we last we're, set off we're in New Zealand. Australia. <laughs> <laughs> because there was something about uh, you know, leaving New Zealand in disgrace when no. you were here last time. Or was that this time? It was. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might it have been was, both times. It was a government that was in disgrace. <laughs> yeah. We were completely exonerated by yeah. the younger population of New Zealand. Was it a true story though, the uh, incident yeah. on the airplane? Uh, the airplanes got slightly distorted. There were lots of airplane stories because we did quite a bit of flying <laughs> around uh, in the tour. And we had this little strange... No, Fokker uh, friendship. Fokker, you have yeah, to be yeah, careful how you say that. Okay. Fokker Fokker friendship. friendship. <laughs> I'll say it again. <laughs> and uh, it was quite funny when we landed at Gisborne, Maori capital, we were told. This is... His what all the New Zealand boys were telling us in the other bands. Um, before the plane had stopped, the kids were on the wings and on top of the plane, like hanging up, yeah. gooning through the windows <laughs> upside down. And the pilot, being a complete twit, panicked and started revving the engine. He wanted to sort of take off, shake them off. Wow. And like, we're all screaming, ah, you know, <laughs> people on the plane. <laughs> he was so worried about his bloody aircraft that he thought, you know, he's going to... No, there were lots of Blow stories. Blow them off of the propellers. Yeah, yeah. 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 He was, uh, it was pretty funny. Yeah. Well, it's good to have you back down here. And, um, well, you know, that name, The Pretty Things, came from a Bo Diddley song originally, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, it certainly did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember sitting in a pub and thinking, what can we call ourselves? You didn't. Yeah. And it <laughs> came out, first of all, we were Jerome and The Pretty Things, yeah, but Phil yeah. got a bit cheesed off because... Everybody assumed he was Jerome. Yeah, that's really stupid. Hi, Jerome. <laughs> People where you walk down the road, like, Jerome, like, no, it didn't turn around. Like, yeah. Who's that they call it? Like that nice Jethro guy in Jethro Tull. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, yeah. Calling yourself, you know, a fake name and suddenly everyone thinks it's real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought it was. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the, the name The Rolling Stones came from a Muddy Waters song. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I was there when that happened as well. So yeah. there you go. Do being you recall that never... day? Was, was yeah. that in a pub as well? Yeah, funny enough, it was uh, the pub where the Stones first rehearsed, yeah. Um, the Bricklayer's Arms in Soho. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we were sitting around going, well, we just played Rolling Stones, so there you go. Well, and there it was. And with us, I think we just played Pretty Thing. And <laughs> <laughs> there it was. And out it comes. Actually, no, I mean, the good thing was, in those days, there were a lot more names to kind of choose from, you know, because... Uh, yes, know, yes, you know. we have kind of run out of names yeah, yeah. now. It's uh, a bit like the sort of internet thing with the dot, dot com, and now you've got <laughs> um, dot everything, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, what about, you know, you had a very short time in the Rolling Stones. Um, yeah. You know, less than a year. Had you not left, Bill Wyman would oh. never have joined. Yeah, I might have been Bill Wyman, mightn't I? Yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was uh, a, a very interesting time, I think, in music then. You know, 1963, 64. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty much before we had super groups and superstars, wasn't it? Yeah. So did I mean, that mean that musicians well, were you, more Well, you had them, but in the mainstream. Uh-huh. Joe and the Pacemakers, you know, the Beatles were super. Yeah, I was going to say that... The, there was so, a super... Certainly... But it wasn't in where we came from. We were left field, art school, beat, beatnik, hippie kind of. You know, we were fringes, fringe music, and you didn't get it played on the radio. Mm. So when the kind of well, R and B revolution took place, it was quite a surprise to everybody. I mean, not least of all us, I think. Mm. And even the Stones. I don't think anybody thought we'd be. We weren't sort of, you know, I mean, particularly charging the charts or wanting to change music. Yeah. It's just it sort of happened. Well, so we, maybe we wanted to change music, but the thought of actually sort of even making a living out of it, I mean, yep. it was far from, far from our minds and far from the Stones' minds, really. Mm. Maybe Brian, I think Brian really, you know, wanted to... That's crack it. Crack it. But uh, I've, I've read he was the, the driving force. Was he really the driving force? To a certain extent, because I, I think there was always a bit of, you know, like the big rift between between them, I think, was to do with him thinking, well, I started the Rolling Stones. And 
the the fact is it was kind of like an amalgamation of 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 two bands you know it was like his band and uh, the thing we were doing already little boy me. blue and the blue yeah, boys yeah 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 that's anyway. a name <laughs> oh yeah can you imagine what would have happened yeah. if uh, you know that had been the uh, the big success well yeah nowadays <laughs> But I think, I think stadiums. Mick and, I think Mick and Keith <laughs> produced enough material to have driven a band, even if Brian hadn't joined. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I think Brian was an incredible ingredient, you know, to the success of the Stones. But if you had to take one of the three of them out, or one of the five of them out, certainly, I suppose Bill and 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 uh, Brian would be the two you could have lost and still had a band that meant something quite important. Not even Charlie. I think Charlie's. I think Charlie's Charlie was essential. kind of. Yeah, I think so. You know, he he was the kind of Ringo to their whatever. Mm. Anyway, enough of that. Enough of to that. their Charlie. <laughs> so Let had them to, come and do their own. Well, yeah, had yeah. this man uh, over town. here not had the good sense to uh, leave the Rolling Stones, we wouldn't have had the Pretty Things. So, well, yeah, yeah. When did yeah, there you go? When did the Pretty Things actually uh, start think for the very first time? We think that our first gig was just before Christmas, sixty three. In the Station Hotel in Dartford. That was our first public one. And mm -hmm. maybe, maybe there's someone somewhere who can go, oh, it was on such and such a date, which was brilliant. Mm. So we you know, played the Arts They, they, have, they may have come to Australia. Once the Stones moved professional, we, nobody could afford them. So that's how we, you know, we started. But our first public date with the kind of, you know, the general public was, I think, said the Station Hotel Dartford. Yeah, and some of the best-known songs from the Pretty Things happened like almost immediately, didn't they? You know, "Don't Bring Me Down." Rosalind. Well, Rosalind was an instant hit. Sort of probably, it felt like ten minutes after we become professional. Yeah, mm. I mean, what Literally. happened was we we were doing all the art school dances around London, and um, we'd done quite a few, and this, and we already had Brian Morrison, who was uh, the social secretary at the art school I was going to and he was our manager and then this other guy came out, a Scottish guy, and said I think I can get you a contract with a record company so they kind of joined forces um, and uh, we went and kind of did a bit of, did we do a recording for? We did a demo. A demo recording for Fontana. Fun, Fontana. Um, well actually I think we saw, they signed us but we, we did a demo to see what was going to be a single yeah 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 mm. something like that um, we'd record Route 66 yeah. and Big Boss Man I think yeah. didn't we yes in Regent Sound yeah, and can, then can, someone might even have that somewhere yeah. but yeah that would be quite useful oh, yeah. um, and then they put us in the studio and we made um, Rosalind you know um, it, it seemed like weeks from when this guy fell up the steps of the Royal College mm. out of his brain saying I'm a talent mm. spotter, I can sign you. And yeah, it, said, was, yeah, it yeah. was actually weeks, really. Yeah, yeah and I said, yeah, we all said, yeah, mate, go and have another drink, you know, bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he turned up following following Monday at Dick's Art School with blokes with contracts and suits, and it was really, it was genuine, but we we thought he was oh. some idiot. Mm. So <laughs> there, there was Rosalind, single number one, Don't Bring Me Down, single yeah, number, number two. two. Honey, I Need, number three. Yeah. Cry To Me, number four. Was it? Was oh, it? Right. Yeah. Was it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Midnight Six, number five. Yeah. yeah. And then, did we, we, when did you become aware David Bowie was a fan of the band? Was it when? Very was, early on. In yeah, the yeah. art school oh. dances. Yeah. Yeah, because he used to follow us around. Oh, he was well. a year younger as a yeah. student yeah. than yeah. us. He was at, uh, another art school down the road from the one which Phil and I were, were in. Um, and we started noticing, you know, just like gigs. He was, he was, he was slightly out of the crowd. He wasn't. Yeah. He was a fan, but he was a bit different. Yeah. He was. And I, I thought he was a stalker. Yeah. He was thinner than anybody else. <laughs> yeah. No, he just. Well, he had a. There was something. He had yeah, an yeah. air about him yeah, that was. Yeah. And also, he just soaked up information about yeah. guitars, music amps. He was obviously, you know, a bit like Jack White is. Yeah. Jack always wants to know what everybody, you know, every instrument, what, what, what gauge strings. He's really a kind of, he's almost anal about how people got sounds. Mm. I think David was, you know, he, he was just soaking it up. Van Morrison once said that the difference between, you know, you and David Bowie was basically the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Well, I don't know. <laughs> so he used Phil May as a role model then. 
Yeah, yeah, well, he did. Maybe he did, I think, yeah. to start with, especially yeah. when he was David Jones on the last. Yeah, round. I don't think Ziggy Stardust no, was based on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that might be the different clothes Van yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I, his eyeliner was a, <laughs> yeah. a brighter shade. Yeah. When you did the SF Sorrow album, and I think Phil, you wrote most of the lyrics for. Yeah, oh, I wrote all the lyrics. Yeah. Um, um, was it not re- quite? Well, yeah. not, not quite, words, young Taylor. man. Ah, oh, no, no yeah. a bit more than that. Was it most of the top lines, by the way. <laughs> was it originally designed as a concept album? Yeah, well, it's sort of, we needed something that wasn't just five A-sides and five B-sides. So we were scrabbling around for another way of making a, making a sort of what you call a 12-inch, um, to fill a, a 12-inch album. And we didn't see why it had to stop and start. In, or, you know, have, and I, I think the narrative thing was something that sort of bubbled through that that's what we'd have to do. And yeah. also you ha- we had opera as a parallel, and that's what they did. They had a libretto, um, all the Faustian, everything, you know, I mean, that, that seemed a logis- sort of logic, logical way to go. Yeah. I think also we had a couple of songs, didn't we, which we'd written. Bracelets. Bracelets and I See You. Um, um, and which as, was actually as, for another project. As, yeah, <laughs> and as the songs progressed, I mean, you started writing the story. Well, the story was written and, and, quite and, a bit before that. Oh, but, was it? Thought, yeah, I mean, I thought, we just I didn't know we wanted to need yeah, one. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, but it, it was called of, Sergeant Sorrow, then, oh, right. funny enough. It certainly kind of, uh, the two things melded, though, didn't they? And it was about the Second World War, so that kind of led into Private Sorrow. Mm-hmm. And, and the balloon thing, the whole kind of timelessness of the thing was, you know, um, we had to be very careful that we, we kept it kind of timeless. And it, so it didn't have to be now to any particularly historical. It just it just sort of shadowed stuff that had gone on. Mm. And then that was before anyone had done a, oh, con- yeah. a rock and roll uh, con- yep. concept album. And the EMI didn't even know what they had. Mm. They wanted to put it out without the story, without anything, mm. <laughs> just in a bag, <laughs> saying new album. Well, we had to pay for the gatefold. Oh, really? In fact, yeah. yeah. Well, they, they rang and said, I think one of the guys rang me and said, "Are the lyrics, in, are the lyrics and story important to be printed?" And I said, "Well, that is a story, of course it is." And so they said, "Well, then we're going to have to charge you seven hundred eighty quid for the setting up the type." So they took that out of our meagre advance, yeah, yeah, mm. which by then was zero, I think, anyway. All went on debts before we. Uh, before we started recording. Well, it's good to see the record industry hasn't changed. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has, funny enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the good thing now for kids is a contract that's too one-sided isn't a contract. Mm. So, you know, unless an, a, a record label makes some concessions to the artist, it, it doesn't stand up in court. Yeah, yeah. I think there's been lawyers challenging a lot of those yeah, yeah. things yes. over the years. Oh, past stuff, yeah. 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 Pa- past stuff was criminal. Mm. I mean, we did. we were meant to have a... Uh, we were uh, we were 18, and at our age, we um, phonogram should have had employed a lawyer on our behalf mm. to to vet the contract that we signed for them, and they didn't. I mean, so I mean, many things they didn't. I do mean, there were so, some weird things, like for instance, like you would think that uh, the contract would be for a percentage mm. of the, of the price, and it was actually in in those days pounds, shillings, and pence (LSD) and. Uh, and um, so, like ten years later, that inflation had obviously got you know mm. gone rampant, but the royalty rates were still written down in, you know, in old money because mm. like Britain went. Decimal. Penny halfpenny, yeah, yeah, yeah. Penny right. halfpenny was our penny royalty. halfpenny, which is, but but but, but not even a um, a new English penny, which yeah. would be, it would be about nowadays. An Australian I, cent. Didn't American. somebody work out that we'd yeah. have to sell something like three million? Oh yeah, yeah. SF Sorrow yeah. to have recouped our two thousand five hundred pound advance. Yeah, wow. yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. We'd have to sell so many records. I mean, you know, it's just yeah. silly. But the, for us, it was important that we got. We found Norman Smith, who found us, and also it for us it was to record Abbey Road. All oh, right. I mean, you know, we didn't even worry about the advance or what the royalty rate was. It was just so we could get in, uh, get you know, to get inside Abbey Road, and that was incredibly important for us. Mm. 1969, you left the band. Yeah. Why was that? Got bored. Yeah? <laughs> Something like that. It was nothing yeah. he said, was it? No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. 
No, it wasn't. It absolutely wasn't. I just wanted... It's all I'd done, you know, for my paltry adult life at that mm. time, you know. And, and I just thought, well, I wanted to do a few other things and uh, finished up producing for Hawkins' first album and yeah. things like that. And uh, they went off and did America and... Yeah. Uh, with Peter Grant and what have you. And That's right, so Peter Grant came into the band. And yeah. Peter a bit Grant. later, well, yeah. We, we had Freeway Madness with a guy called Bill Shepard. Mm -hmm. um, well, after Dick left, of course, we made, Bonnie and I kind of wrote and made Parachute. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was kind of a very lauded album. Uh, Rolling Stone Record of the Year and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, you know, again, EMI just didn't seem to understand what they had. And um, it took people like Granty and Zeppelin, you know, to come along. And when they formed their, were asked to form their record label by Atlantic, um, Robert and Jimmy asked me if they said, we, we don't know we'll do it because we don't want them just to hang it on our name. Mm. If we have control and they will let us sign only the people we want to sign, would you sign? I said, yeah, yeah. This is six months before it even happened. Mm. Um, and when they came up and said, we've, we've done the deal, we've got complete control, um, we signed. And I just felt at the time that there was nobody who could take on Peter Grant as the head of the record label mm. to fight our case. So I said to Peter, we'll only sign if you be our manager. And he said, oh, you know, look, I've got Led Zeppelin. Why do I, I need you like a hole in the head? You like, <laughs> your ex-manager told me right, you are <laughs> He said, Brian Morrison had already told me you're unmanageable. Yeah. So he said, all right then. So that's how it happened. Well, yeah. And now we've got Mark, Mark St. John to tell us we're unmanageable. Well, I, and also we had Peter, Peter until he died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was consultant. Right, yeah. right up until the time. Right until yeah. he died, yeah. yeah. He helped us with the law cases. He helped us with a lot of setting up of, of stuff. And he was great. I mean, he was like our, our armchair general. Mm. And Mark referred to him and... He helped Mark in a lot of kind of situations, <coughs> got advice. Mm. Jim McCarty was a, a member of the band at one point. No, 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 no. 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 What, that, what was, that was, that was a kind of side project. Um, and it was like the Pretty Things Yardbird blues band because uh -huh. they were us two out the Pretty Things. Um, Jim. Jim. Uh, and uh, Ricky Hyatt. Well, it could be. Richard Hyatt Rick, from the uh, Canty. Yeah, it could have Studebaker been. Baker John. Yes, mm. it could have been the... Uh, Pretty things, Yardberg, Cans Heat, All Studebaker. <laughs> All sorts. Yeah, something, so something like that. Somewhat of a supergroup before supergroups. Wow. Well, oh, no, no, this was, this was later. Thing. This was 1992. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. So I knew Jim way back when. In fact, I, I met his, go I met his him, girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, we know Jim a lot with Yardbirds, obviously, for ages. Keith Ralph and things. And then Keith did it something with his sister, didn't he? Um, that little band. I mean, the thing is, it was quite a close community of all the sort of bands around that time. There was a lot of sort of co-existence and people. I mean, we got Pete Tolson from Air Apparent, mm. who I played football with and Wally played football with, and they said they were breaking up, but they had a really great young 16-year-old guitarist, would, and we were looking for one, and, and Peter joined us. You know, so it was all... Yeah. I mean, the cross fertilisation. Yeah, wasn't it? in our agency, there was there was us. There was Pink Floyd, uh, T Rex, T Rex, um, Ainsley Dunbar, who went on to play with Frank yeah. Zappa, Tomorrow, Herbie Goins, Tomorrow, which later yeah. became the Pink Fairies and Fairies. Uh -huh. I, 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 I can't think of any Herbie more. Goins was there on the night time. Yeah, yeah, loads. Oh, of it was really kind of integrated. Yeah, yeah. and them, and the, oh, yeah, band. Or, or, yeah. Or, well, agency, one of the versions, yeah, yeah, one of yeah. the versions of yeah, them, yeah. 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 Um, uh, our agency, I think, for them. But yeah. Yeah, it's very, very cross fertilisation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You told the funny story about uh, Nick and Ringo's drum kit one night. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Well, we did, didn't we? Mm. We went to the cupboard, and there's <laughs> the big monster bass drum. You were recording at Abbey Road at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. And. Uh, they left the studio and we yeah. were there till two or three, four or five. Yeah, and we were trying to get a big drum sound. And uh, so thought, we know where there's a big drum <laughs> <laughs> or some big drums. 
into uh, into Ringo's office. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, I, th- I think it might have even been set up because they were recording next door to us. I think yeah. it was in st- in the cupboard in Studio oh, One, it? right at the back of the yeah. room. I, I know remember. they were recording at yeah. the same time. They yeah. were doing the White Album. And yeah. what what song from the Pretty Things is that drum used? Oh, I wish I could remember. I don't know. I think we had this conversation mm. before, mm. and I can't honestly <laughs> remember. I might have something to do with the acid, Dick. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's definitely on. It's definitely on SF Sorrow. Um, but I so wonder how acid makes you lose sense of time and cupboards and <laughs> things. <laughs> Luckily, we came out of the cupboard. Might got in there and still been there now. <laughs> It's oh, a nice cupboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what well, have we come in here for? <laughs> well, guys, congratulations on the 50th anniversary. Yeah, That's thank a, you. Quite a milestone. When it comes up, yeah, yeah next yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, It's not too far away. No, it's not, is it? It's no. about a year and a... Well, technically. You're you know, a year you, and if, about if, 10 days. If you reckon if you reckon 1963, just oh, before the year. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it was, nine, it was the end of 1963. Which? Just before. But the yeah, first record release now. was 64. 64, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I suppose, yeah. Well, we've got two anniversaries. It's the year. The two year. anniversaries, yeah, yes. Two anniversaries. Yeah, yeah. All right. The Pretty Things joining us here at noise11.com.